started at 43. We'll keep it brief. Perfect. All right. So welcome to Coachable. This is my first live in-person recording, and I am really stoked to be here with Dr. Kyle Balzer. Um, and, and we've been talking, talking, talking about all sorts of things within the physical therapy and training realm forever. But my first time again with an in-person guest, so I'm stoked to see how this goes, where our conversation goes. Welcome. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a hug. Oh. Because we're, we're close enough to do right? a welcome hug. Isn't that fun? Uh, yeah, this is uh, <laughs> it's my first, too. I've only done so many podcasts, but right now we've set the bar so high for in-person podcasting. I mean, in-person, this is going to change the game. It really yeah. is. Yeah. It really is. I mean, we're, we have our, our really advanced technological setup today. So um, for people watching at home, you probably can't replicate this. This is a lot of we went it we it didn't it wasn't that much. But anyway, so um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the the backstory about Kyle, and then I'm gonna ask him to keep going. But uh, from 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 for us watching Kyle, uh, he has been a really integral part of about our community here. It's been what two years, three years, probably two and change. Yeah. So two years roughly being here as a physical therapist and uh, and coach and integrating those two together, which is another topic. But what I think is most interesting is what you're also being and doing with social media, with Chris, uh, with Charlie, with speaking. But, but first and foremost, tell me a little bit about the backstory about Kyle and how you got here. Can't tell you how I got here without mentioning upstate New York. All right. Um, but I'll keep that part brief from upstate New York. Anyway, been practicing physical therapy for 11 years, did all my schooling upstate except for one year of college in Western New England. Um, you know, I came across Charlie's work, Charlie Weingroff. I came across his work and what was going on at Drive 495 while I was in PT school circa 2011, 2012, mm -hmm. and did the whole like Facebook messenger thing at the time and just like poked and prodded at Charlie through social media and, and then in person too, like he did sure. training equals rehab at RPI. Um, and he was just, yeah, come on. Like you let me observe in, in New Jersey, in the city. And then, uh, I just stayed in his ear. And then eventually he was like, you still want to work at drive? I'm like, yeah, that's my dream job. Mm -hmm. Um, so my dream job in PT school was to work at drive 495 with Charlie and Don Saladino. Um, and that's what I started doing roughly, I think, over eight years ago now. Wow. Um, so yeah, Charlie and I have been in this thing for almost a decade now, and here we are. Yeah. And well, there's something powerful you mentioned. Did you have to pay, or was that a paid internship when you were, uh, or, or I should say structured internship when you were with Charlie, or was that something you were just like, hey, can I watch? And Charlie was just like, sure, come on, you can watch. Yeah, it, it was the latter. Yeah. I mean, one of my internships was in North Jersey, and we worked Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 13-hour days. So I had Tuesday, Thursday off. Um, and I think at that point, Charlie was training and treating at uh, Fit for Life in Marlboro. Okay. Um, and so I drove down like an hour and a half, two hours, washed into like a session or two, and then drove home. And that, that was how I wanted to spend my free time at the time. Uh, so, and actually still sort of do. Like when Charlie's here, I obviously want to sure. see what he's doing, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's... And, and what was it about Charlie? So you're in the physical therapy world and then you look at and see, man, this guy's doing some interesting things. What was it about his training, his therapy, his communication? What was it that attracted you at first to, and not just, not, not just necessarily to Charlie, because there's certainly, he has a charm, but I also think there's, there's, there's lessons in leadership where you see somebody that, you know, game recognized game. What did you recognize that, that you were like, I want to do what, what he's doing? All right, so I got to mention, Larie Draper uh, was putting out, I, they weren't even called podcasts at the time. Okay. I don't know what makes a podcast a podcast and not just like recorded audio. Okay. Um, but she was putting out these movement lectures, mm -hmm. and she was also the publisher of Gray Cook's book about movement. Okay. And she actually helped me get my internship in Montville. Um, so she was like a huge connection. I still never even met her in person. She was just always somebody that was like willing to connect people in their professional lives. Um, she put out, uh, she started putting out these movement lectures. Charlie put out one, I think it was called the trainable human human system. Okay. Where, I mean, my mind was just blown because we were learning 
basic physical therapy things in PT school. And he was talking about why to continue training with people, you, you know, uh, maybe more nervous system -y things. I couldn't even tell you what it's about at this point. Um, I might listen to it now and be like, oh, yeah, of course, these all make a lot of sense. But at mm -hmm. that time, I was just so drawn to how he was just talking about the human body and how it can adapt to stress and this and that. Um, and it was, you know, I'll also say like comparing it to all the other movement lectures that were being put out, I was like, this is just, it, Charlie does not ever slack on the quality of content. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. know how to do less than what his standard for himself is. Um, and so, uh, and, and then that on top of like working in a gym in a one-on-one -on -one setting, completely uh, cash based, I like everything he was doing. I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And then I got to do it. And so, I still do. So you saw the contrast in communication, the content, and obviously the educational component behind Charlie and what he was doing. You also saw, saw a contrast. And I think there's some lessons here too, because I get some people that ask, Oh, what you know, do any of your physical therapists accept insurance? So tell me a little bit more about how the business model that you guys run is a little bit different and the advantages to, to doing it. Cause I have a backstory about one of them too, but tell me a little bit more about the, the, the background. So yeah, when, when I first started working with Charlie, Charlie, Charlie's completely cash based. Um, and I was completely cash based until I started learning about out of network billing, which in New York city, New York city is one of the few probably places where you still have out of network policies that will bill out or um, will pay out a reasonable rate for physical therapy. You can go other areas of the country, whether it's in network or out of network, it's like uh, an hour with a physical therapist is worth like 60 bucks, 70 bucks. Medicare is like 90 bucks to $110. Wow. It, yeah. It, like, like offensive numbers. Huh. Um, but at least in New York city, there are policies that will pay out a couple hundred bucks or more. Um, so once I figured this out and got connected with somebody who could do billing for me, because even the amount I do, the amount of work I do to make it possible for my biller to bill it out. Right. It's like pushing almost too much time and taking me away from other things where I couldn't imagine doing all billing on my own. Um, but once I figured out that I could then capture another net of people mm -hmm. with, yes, actually we do take some out of network insurance policies, mm -hmm. just nothing in, in network. And I actually probably can't be in network with a lot of, uh, uh, insurance companies because with New York city and the, the density of business, like each zip code, I believe is only allotted a certain number of clinics that could be in network. At least this is what I've been told. Yeah. Um, somebody might've been blowing smoke, which is fine. Cause yeah. it's, it's just become an easier way for me to tell people why I'm not in network mm -hmm. other than the obvious ones. Like, well, I don't want to see four to six people an hour. Right. I don't want the insurance companies totally dictating how many times I see somebody, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how we became a bit of, uh, a hybrid of cash based and out of network billing. And there's also from what I've been able to observe this real big handoff of you guys are very good at, all right, so you're good. You feel good. You're learning the dynamic warm up. You're learning warm ups before workouts. You're learning how to be efficient there. Then you're handing off their physical therapy exercises, kind of, again, the training equals rehab, but also you're seeing that your, your handoff is very smooth between what you guys do from a physical therapy setting and then and this is what i can see from and then from the training side to somebody who may not be well versed in the training world they might not see that transition because it it does look integrated talk to me a little bit about the role of this concept where any exercise could be a rehab exercise but it's also a training exercise why is training equal rehab i mean it's funny you say that because that's probably what i was drawn to in charlie's movement lecture years ago mm -hmm. is that i mean like it just depends on what the goal is. Mm -hmm. Like it, it depends on what the goal is. And then it depends on the effort and intent you get out of the exercise. If you're doing an exercise that maybe is a little bit just cerebral and you're trying to accomplish some sort of movement quality out of, then it's probably classified as a PT exercise because you're trying to improve somebody's hip range of motion or their ability to touch their toes. Mm -hmm. Or if you do something for, you know, three sets of 10, which gets, bashed because that's all physical therapists know how to prescribe when they get out of mm -hmm. school. But three sets of 10 is pretty, pretty good. As long as you're just doing three sets of 10 at like what, 70 to 80%. Right. So, but most PT clinics are probably not having people do three sets of 10 and 70, 80%. So I digress. Um, I guess why it's sort of 
seamless is, you know, Charlie's mine, Chris's and Eric's like, Eric is, you know, the, the newest PT to the team. Um, you sort of have this idea of the end in mind, like our mm -hmm. end in mind, isn't just bending over to touch your toes. Our end in mind is like, touching toes, being able to touch your toes and standing without pain is like the equivalent of being able to deadlift. Mm -hmm. So we're already thinking about touching your toes to get back to deadlifting mm -hmm. or squatting so that you can load the squat or box jump. Mm -hmm. um, so that it just becomes this sort of smooth process of getting back to athletic things, assuming that's what people want to get back to. But that's sort of how we've positioned ourselves in New York city only working in gyms mm -hmm. with gyms that understand what we would consider quality training so that it's like the filter is already there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't work with a whole lot of inactive folks unless they're inactive and they want to be guided on how to become active. So the, the story that I was thinking about um, because it just happened was uh, in, in terms of the, the value of what you guys do and the solution that you guys offer. And some would argue that you're expensive, but I think there's, there's a difference between an investment and, and the value of something versus something that, you know, a specific cost. And so when I was in St. Louis, I got a couple of haircuts at uh, Fantastic Sam's that weren't so fantastic. And I, I found myself not doing camera work because I was like self-conscious of this. So yes, it cost $20. And yes, I was in and out in 15 minutes, but as soon as I started going back here, which is $60 for a haircut in New York, and I would get a haircut and then I'd go on camera and then I'd produce more content and then more people would see it. There was a trickle down effect, even though it costs more, right? The value of what happens and the investment of time. And I would argue that it was only 15, 20 minutes more, but the value of, of that, if you don't do it right, you have to do it over yep. kind of thing. And I think for a lot of people within the physical therapy well realm and, and world and in the personal training realm is some of them may not know the difference between a fantastic Sam's and a barber, right? And so, you know, the, the difference between a physical therapist who is treating, like you said, four, six, eight, ten people at a time, right? There's a new movement coming out where technically the, the phrase is rest is not therapy anymore, right? And so there's there's this whole wave of, of change coming within the industry and then how, how it impacts, whether it's healthcare or recovery from injuries or training is going to be fascinating to me. But I just wanted to pass on that story for you because that's, that's, that's literally sitting in the barber chair today. And I was like, boom, this is, this is the lesson, right? You want to do it again? Or do you want to like, like it's, it just carries over so much. And Kyle's not cheap. Uh, Charlie's not cheap, but the, the concept isn't cheap. It's, it's when you go to, to Kyle, which leads me to my next question. But when you go to Kyle or Charlie, you're getting a solution for your problem. You know, like remember when last year I had that, that elbow pain? If you were to ask me, what would be the number that I would pay to have that go away? It would probably be in the mid, like low thousands because it was, it was waking me up at night. It was interrupting my golf game. It was interrupting lifting, interrupting rowing. Like it was interrupting things that I love to do. Yeah. And I think so often people have this disconnect of, I'm just going to not do it. Right. Cause what it, what it, what's the most common thing you people say uh, to Maybe, I'm going to be careful what I say here, but a lot of people will tell you, oh, it hurts when I, when I do rowing or running. Well, don't run a row. And it's like, okay. So the only joy that you have is the endorphins that you are getting from row, running or rowing. And now you're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So your elbow is not going to get better and you're going to stop doing things that make other things better in your body. Correct. Yeah. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. And so, which leads me into my other thing about um, cheap, because I, I wanted to talk about your, you, Kyle had a, a podcast where he was saying his program design is not his specialty. And, and so I, I wanted to challenge him on that because I've seen him program for himself. I've seen him program for others and, and he doesn't work in a silo. He works with Chris and he works with his uh, new physical therapist and obviously with Charlie. But what, what makes you, what made you say that? And how do you, how are you, if you do believe that, what are you doing to address it? I mean, look, I'm, I'm a physical therapist first, strength coach second, and Charlie is a mentor of mine and Charlie's programming is, or ability to program and understand every little nuance of human physiology and, and uh, stress and adaptation. Uh, so I'm one, I'm usually comparing myself to Charlie Fair. Two, I definitely have a little bit of imposter syndrome, but I mean, 
you might be right. Like I am, I'm such like a simple, I like to think as simply as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, like that doesn't mean I like to take shortcuts. I just like to think as simply as possible. So most of my training programs for most people look very similar. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to toot my own horn and say, uh, that I'm better at programming than I give myself credit for that. I'll give you the mic right back, Kevin. Well, and, and be, I think it boils down to, you know, look, we, we have the, we have the need to express power, right. For, for not just the athlete, but for the everyday person, we have the need to express power, strength, and then endurance. And then in the, the capacities that we are not able to, if we don't address them, then we need to call Kyle or Charlie and be like, Hey, this hurts when I do that. Cause like, and I can't do it. Can you help me get better? So in, in that, to that extent, you're very good at, at, like you said, connecting the dots, not just to the toe touch, but to the deadlift. And so this goes into the next question about when you see people that maybe are, let's say they say they're, oh, my hamstrings are tight. Because that's very common. Oh, I just need to stretch my hamstrings, right? Like, how, what is your messaging regarding somebody that may not understand necessarily that it's not their hamstrings? How do you, what, what is your messaging specifically? How do you go about uh, implementing the, they think they just need to stretch and do a toe touch all day, but how do you, how do you go against, or how do you go about communicating, but also implementing the, the strategies that they, they need to be successful? That's a tough question to answer, <clears throat> probably because it's different each time. Yeah. And, and that's where like, all right, so when I program, like, put the, the patient or client aside mm-hmm. that is like it's spreadsheets, it's algorithms. It's, you know, you know, pull something out, put something back in where I'm probably become an overthinker is when it's like a one-to-one human interaction. Mm-hmm. So that very much has to do with like reading the person in front of me mm-hmm. and what their previous experiences are. Um, you know, I, I, certain people I might just be coy with and be like, Oh, okay. So Stretch your hamstrings. You don't need to pay me hundreds of dollars to tell you to do that. Oh, well, I tried that. I'm like, okay. So you tried stretching your hamstrings and your toe touch is still tight. Do you mind if I show you what else might be going on Mm -hmm. or how else we might be able to improve your ability to touch your toes? Mm -hmm. Or it's as simple like, you know, with using the SFMA as our primary uh, movement assessment, that sort of just unfolds naturally to show people when they don't necessarily have tight hamstrings, if they don't have tight hamstrings. Um, because you sometimes will say, okay, so you're standing, your feet together, bend over and touch your toes. Okay, you can. Not a problem. Let's see how you do it with, you know, one knee bent and one uh, ankle bent. Mm-hmm. Oh, now you can do it on one side, but not the other. Or... You, oh, interesting. You can't do it if both feet are flat, but if either foot or leg is bent, then you have both. Mm-hmm. Or then it's, you know, seated or active versus passive straight leg raise. It's like because the SFMA is so redundant in what it looks at, mm-hmm. it sometimes does the communicating for you. There are also times where you sometimes, uh, sometimes I'll just tell somebody, look, this is your hamstring stretch now. And to me, it's not a hamstring stretch. Right. But to them, they can call it whatever they want as long as they do it. And we help them get their goal or reach their goal. You, there's, there's a couple things to unpack, but I don't know if you heard what Kyle said. Basically, when I said about the hamstring stretch, you said it depends, right? And in <laughs> essence, right? Because that's, that's the right answer, right? Is it depends. There's so many factors. Yeah, and, and, and certainly pat yourself on the back. But also the, the, the theme of it depends in addition to there's probably 30 more questions that you're going to ask as the, as the practitioner to find out, I call it like Hansel and Gretel. Like you gotta, they gotta give you the little crumbs to find out where, where the, that's it. Got it. Okay. Now we have a little bit closer to a solution based approach as, as, as it pertains to you rather than, okay, here's just a better hamstring stretch. Throw your feet up on the wall. Right. Right. Like that. Okay. Yes. Is it better? Nah, maybe not. So, but something also that you said, uh, as far as the specifics, let's talk about, so you guys in your avatar about who you work with, you tend to work with an active population that values the quality and the intensity and the, the longevity of their workout, um, capacity in order to Im- improve their sport or performance. What are some themes that you notice with these high performance, whether it's their mindset, whether it's their, uh, from a workout perspective, what are some themes that you notice that everyone kind of does? That's that impresses you or, or just shows up on paper or in, in person. 
Can you ask that one more time? <laughs> you see high performers all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they have in common? Oh, I mean, are you we, we talking like high performers? Yeah. I mean, most of them are like elite genetics. Like I think that's okay. probably from a, a scientific standpoint, mm -hmm. like you just have to be given – you just are given something okay. that 99% of people are not given. Fair. Um, now, they're also – I might be picking up on where you want me to go with this. They're very coachable. Like that is a theme with high performers as well. Right. Um, because we do get folks who aren't high performers, uh, but maybe later in life we'll talk about the avatar. Maybe it's like a 45 or 50-year-old like person – that was not a high performer, but all of a sudden they see the value in taking care of blood work and, you know, making sure they're training the right way and this and that. Mm -hmm. And they, they probably have aspirations to train like the high performer, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, I'm going to temper my expectations. The first time I ask them to skip sideways or the first time they trap our deadlift, it's, it usually takes a different amount of time. Or looks differently, looks different out of the gate compared to the high performers. Right. Um, what about you? What What do I see from all, all perform? Well, you mentioned the coachable, and I and I certainly think that there's um, a certain coachability that they, you know, they they have feedback monsters. I'm um, technically like if if I don't get feedback, I'm gonna be like, so how was that? Right. I'm gonna you know talk to me. Good, easy, medium, hard. Was that? Where did you feel that? When When did you feel that? Oh, you felt some pain. You know, like I'm gonna be that that the searching for, like I said, with that Hansel and Gretel, I'm going to be searching for the thing that's going to clue me into where we need to go from here. But um, as far as the, this is, this is my next question about um, high performing coaches and practitioners, right? So you're also, in, you've been in the room with some TPI wizards, right? You've been in the room with, uh, obviously with Charlie, but so you've also seen some high performers when it comes to helping others. What are some things that they have in common? Because I like the phrase "best in the world," um, but what are, what are what are the phrase you know what are the what are the traits that that the people who are the best in the world? What what, what have you seen from them? Oh, I mean, I'm a big like like passion guy. Sure. Like I think there has to be some sort of hunger or passion. Mm -hmm. Like, and that you know high performers also also usually pretty you know hungry or uh passionate about what they do you know look at like you know tom brady michael jordan Sidney crosby like these guys will just do whatever they have to on and off the court or ice the field the pitch whatever to win like mm -hmm. yes it's nice to make money along the way maybe the fame is nice too but what was tom brady's quote was like which you know which ring is your favorite the next one yeah. like that's sort of what it is um so i think that's it um you know for us specifically, like, yes, we are very hungry. We want to be the best. Um, so you can never, like, I think there's moments in maybe a year, like, uh, you know, physical therapists or professionals, we don't have a season, but it's mm -hmm. almost like we do. Right. Like, I think I naturally uh, go through phases where I want to read more things about the human body or training or whatever it is. And then I go through phases where I'm, you know, reading about calculus and Jimi Hendrix, mm -hmm. but then also still find myself trying to apply what I read in those books to what I do. So it's just like, even when I'm trying to take a break from it, mm -hmm. it just still works it's, its, its way out. back. In. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just, I, I'm so driven by the people that I haven't been able to help as quickly as I want to, mm -hmm. as opposed to like the reward when somebody gives you positive feedback is fine. That's mm -hmm. great. I mm -hmm. love it. It's just like it very quickly. I mean, it doesn't go in one ear and one out one ear. Like the one I just got, I'm like, yeah, like it'd be nice to have in writing someday. Mm -hmm. But by the time I go to sleep tonight, that one, like that's not even thought about anymore. So right. one where I'm like, what did I miss? Like, mm -hmm. did I miss something? Um, and so maybe there's just something about like, I, I mean, I guess my wife, like I don't like being wrong, mm -hmm. but I do think I do have a pretty good job or do a pretty good job of reflecting on something after I can like remove myself emotionally mm -hmm. from it. And like recently from it, they're probably tied together. Um, and then look at a situation and be like, okay, what, you know, maybe what breadcrumbs or clues uh, a guy I learned from a couple of weeks ago, he said he likes Sherlock Holmes. So he's always looking for Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes type clues. I'm like, what sort of clues did I miss? Or did, did I leave myself that I now have to look for outside the situation? Love that. You know, you said, 
previously too that there was a utopian experience at Drive 495 and, and the gym that it was in terms of the, 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 the size, the space, I mean, legendary space, right? Who trained there, et cetera. How, how you mentioned that the goal maybe for um, you, Charlie and team um, is to get into that, that, that environment again, where it is sort of this horizontal versus a vertical application of practitioner, uh, practitioners. How, how important is that to not just to the practitioner, but to the, to the person coming in to the doors? How important is that? Yeah, it, it's most important um, because you can, you can do it without it even being in a brick and mortar, but it really is about having the, like the team. When I say the team, it's like the team of professionals around the individual has to be like, everybody really has to be on the same page mm -hmm. because this set, like, uh, I don't want to say like, well, I had a post recently, but like I had a post <laughs> recently about, I called it clinical storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I Googled this phrase because I'm like, I think I might be the first one to have said this. I might've come up with something original. Um, but each person that comes through the door is the hero of their own story. Sure. And I mean, we're also the heroes of our own story. So like they become an ancillary character that we want to get better. Yada, yada, yada. But they're the hero of their own story. And if they're getting information from seven people and half of it is conflicting, mm. like how do they continue down the path of their story with, you know, a quote unquote happy ending? Sure. Um, and that's really what I've been able to, you know, 10, 10 years out or eight years out with Charlie reflect on is, you know, my first job was a great first job. Uh, and I learned a lot from it, but probably one of the things I learned was, you know, just, Oh, if somebody come, like I, I can't work with somebody now without knowing like every other little thing that is going on in their life outside of, mm -hmm. you know, their hour with me or hour and a half with me or whatever it is, because it all matters so much. Like I used to just think, all right, somebody's going to come in, you know, three times a week. I got, you know, I got 30 minutes with them. They're going to do their exercises with the aid. But yeah, this is going to fix people. This is what PT school mm -hmm. told me would fix people. And I probably couldn't even see how many people I didn't quote unquote fix because you're seeing so many people that people just fall off the schedule mm -hmm. or they bounce between providers or they go on vacation and they don't come back or they do go to an orthopedist and their orthopedist says, oh, like I'll just inject you maybe rightfully so or wrongfully so. Like mm -hmm. it's just the, just the communication and the team is so important that that has to supersede any egos in uh, – in a single person's uh, process or outcomes. I also think it eliminates blind spots as far as mm -hmm. being a, a, a practitioner. You know, like for instance, when we, when I came in and, and, I, and I talked to you and Chris about my elbow, you both were, first of all, asked probably 300 questions, which was helpful. <laughs> no, no, but really, yeah, yeah. right? And, and so we were thinking about, you know, and Chris was like, oh, first rib and, and, and maybe your upper trap and then your neck. And then we found out you, know, I, you kept asking questions. And I think the thing I told you was that when I went to go, you know, fold a pillowcase or put a, a pillow in a, a pillowcase on a pillow. Yeah. That's what I was like, hmm, this isn't right. I'm like, interesting. Yeah. Interesting yeah. functional test. Right. But uh, I also think that the the tendency of a lot of practitioners is, all right, so your elbow hurts. Let's, let's look at the elbow and then, okay, let's see the, the elbow and let's chest the elbow and your range of motion looks good. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we just uh, get some ice on it and, and some stem and then, and look, I, I'm old enough that I went to school from 2001 to 2005. So the, the textbook that we had, rice was, was big, right? You're going to rest it. You're just going to rest it. You give it a little elevation, right? And then you're going to ice it. And, and now so much has changed. But also within that same context, Greg Cook was adamant about like, and, and Mike Boyle about joint by joint. Like, like everything has a requirement. And if something doesn't get that requirement, it's going to go elsewhere. And I think the, the, the same application there of the joint by joint approach also matters to the, to the client because they, they, in that, that linear business model is the relationship. If they, the client doesn't want to go to three different places. They don't want to go here and then go to somewhere else for cardio and then to go physical therapy here and then go back to their trainer. They don't want to have three, four, you know, five different sources. They, they like it to be all in one spot. So I think there's, there's lessons there, but also like, as I look for, you know, the next version of, you know, structure, which is technically, this is technically 3.0, you know, when I got it in 2017, you know, there was only two squat racks here. Wow. There's 13 now. Yeah. So when we look at how the practitioner can can really function, 
whether it's a physical therapist like you and Chris, or whether it's a, uh, a trainer, it, man, the application of uh, scale is, is available, but also um, there's, there's a lot of options, right? We have a, a longer turf. We have more sleds. We have more cables, more barbells. I don't even know how many barbells we have at this point. Kettlebell. <laughs> but the, the, I guess the, the next question slash thought is, um, you know, again, you, you look ahead to what's next for you, what's next for Charlie. You mentioned previously that you're trying to get into speaking and content and your content game has stepped up. What is next for for you, maybe for the, let's go for you first. What's next for Kyle in, in within your own practice, but also maybe social media content? What do you, what's, what's going on in calculus? <laughs> yes. Always calculus. Um, I would, all right, let's, let's try and address each of those independently without rambling on too much about one. Uh, so the social media, like, you know, I'm going to give Don Salad, you know, a big shout out and a big apology because Don was an early adopter to social media. Mm -hmm. Like he saw so early when we were working at drive, the importance of, you know, building your, you know, Instagram resume. Sure. And you know, like, I would say most of us there poo pooed it. Mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, I was like, Oh, I'm making more money than I ever thought I could make. I'm busier than I ever thought I could be like, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? And then fast forward mm -hmm. to like, you know, maybe, the year I turned 35 last year, I leveled up in a few ways and, and maybe I just became a much more mature version of myself, but I'm like, damn, Don was right. And even at points since then, it was Charlie saying like, you need a website, you need to do social media. And I'm like, but why? And now I'm like, man, when Dr. O'Malley, the greatest foot and ankle surgeon in the world says, I'm going to have you see Kyle and Charlie in New York city. And then somebody <laughs> maybe goes to my Instagram or just Googles me and they don't see me with a website. Mm -hmm. They see me on Charlie's website. I did do that, but I do have a website now. Um, but my social media had to be more than Rangers games, concerts, Gosh. dogs, and now a baby. Um, I, it just, I just needed my social media to represent me as a professional. Like it, I, you know, I, I guess one of the ways I'm not quite coachable sometimes is I really like to come to realizations myself. Sure. Not all of them. Mm -hmm. Like, if Charlie tells me something, if Don tells me something, if people in my life that I respect or, you know, respect their game have advice for me, I'm usually pretty open to it, but it took me really realizing this one. So, you know, I found Ed who was helping Charlie with his social media, which is great because I don't like doing the social media stuff. I don't like being in front of a camera. I don't like talking about things that I don't know what other people want me to talk about. Like when you, you got questions, I might have answers, mm -hmm. but to just like, poof, pull something out of thin air and be sure. like, this is what everybody wants to hear me talk about for exactly 30 seconds. Probably. Right. Um, I'm not always confident about that. So that's been good. So I'm working on that. And you know, that is also preparing me for hopefully doing more things like this. Cause this is another good way to promote myself and the team, which as the team gets bigger, it allows me more time to promote myself because, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. That's something that we've preached for years as our, uh, you know, our team. Um, but I do want to do, you know, the speaking circuit a little bit more. I, mm -hmm. I think I can reach more people about, you know, training equals rehab and regressions and lateralizations or the importance of coaches maybe having a little bit more of a plan or standard operating procedure when somebody in pain comes through the door because, you know, I think we see people a lot as physical therapists, but I think coaches, like trainers, coaches, they see people in pain probably 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. And really there should just be some sort of plan other than, you know, them saying, oh, like, we'll just do lower body then. Yeah. Or even like, oh yeah, of course your back hurts. Like you have lower cross syndrome or your back hurts. Like you're not engaging your core. I'm like, you can't, one, you don't have the right to tell somebody why they're in pain. Um, but two, you not even going about like testing and assessing the right way. Um, so I just want to give people what I think are, I'm a realist. So like I can give people like the ideal scenario of like, this is how it should be done. Sure. You should have somebody in the gym. Like you mm -hmm. should have a physical therapist in the gym sure. and you should just say, you have pain, go see Kyle. You have pain, go see Chris. But I also realized that, like you said, like people, there's like people just have barriers to doing things. So it's got to be a little bit more real of an approach. 
Um, so I sort of come up with scenarios that I think, you know, when I spoke at body space fitness in the fall, I felt pretty good about like how to bucket those things. Um, and we won't get into it today, but like, there's like when you've worked with somebody for three years and they come in with pain on Monday, it's different than when somebody that walk, like they see there's a gym and they walk in, they're like, Hey, I want to start training. And they have pain. Like right. Very you different. and I both know that those are handled differently. Very different. Um, so yeah, I, you know, speaking like, you know, hoping to get with perform better. Those are my people. I love it. Love, love Eric Falk and, and Poirier yep. and Milani's and, uh, you know, and I, I know Eric's kids like, perform better's family to me. Same. Um, so for them to consider me family at some point would mean a lot. Uh, and then coming along with that, like consulting with gyms, like Sir, I can help gyms come up with standard operating procedures so that like Kevin can say, Hey guys, this is how we're going to handle when somebody new comes in with pain. Like these are the questions we need to ask them. And this is our list of people we refer to. And then at least you can, do right by yourself, but also do right by them saying like, Hey, you should see your GP. You should see an orthopedist. You should see whomever. Um, and then, then it's up to them. And then, and then you do what you do best. Uh, I love that. And, and you know, what's funny is, is I was thinking of two different things when you're, when you were speaking there, the, the first one, remember that show house? Yeah. So I, 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 I still use this to this day where he says, you know, everybody lies, but not because they, they lie on purpose. They just don't tell you. They don't tell, so they're lying because they're not giving you all the whole story. So that's where I think you are and Chris and, and Charlie have this, this this remarkable ability to to kind of pull out yeah. that that story from people because they they are lying until you get to that one thing. Finally, got it. Okay, now I have a better picture. Um, but the the other component to this is I think the the integration again of the the practitioner. So when somebody comes in and does have pain. And, you know, I'm, I'm a former powerlifter. So, you know, if, if we, if a regular conventional deadlift bothered us, what would we do? We'd just make it higher. Yeah. Okay. So we do a rack deadlift. Okay. Well, and then we rack deadlift and be like, oh, that works. And I feel that more in my, my glutes. Okay, cool. Can I do it another way too? All right. And then you start to, the, the, the traditional concept of, ah, don't do that. Yeah. Right? Don't stop doing that. that. It's so outdated at this point of like, ask better questions. You're going to find better answers and solutions. And I think the the evolving nature of all of this is fascinating to me because, again, I went to school when the main treatment, like we had a guy and he was Mr. Ice. Like he, he just, he was like, ice works, ice works, ice, like everybody, you know? <laughs> and so uh, meanwhile, I'm like in the, the, the sport and performance world. And I was like, look, I, I know I'm in this athletic training program and I know I'm, I'm doing what I'm told. However, I had difficulty wrapping my head around the fact that blood flow wasn't being emphasized more than, you know, the, the stopping the blood flow and then back and forth. And, this, and, I, and so all of this to say, um, you know, the, the concept I think that you and Charlie bring to the industry is for me, like when I, when I hear Charlie or when I, when Eric Cressy was on Tim Ferriss, I was like, this is, this is so powerful because these messages are, I feel like they're everywhere because I only listen in yeah, the silo yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to Cressy and to you and, and to, to Charlie and to a couple others. Um, but you know, the, the other concept that you've, you, you're noticing with Don is he was remarkable in, in probably getting on you again, about you know, we often need to be reminded more than we need to be told. Yeah. Right. And so that's the gentleness of, of existing in somebody's life for long enough so that you can, you know, now, oh, you know, how's that social media going, Kyle? And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but you know, it, it is, it's just a remarkable thing of, Having that, that 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 person in your life, whether it's a coach, physical therapist, massage therapist, trainer, whatever, um, social media, you know, like Ed, yeah. when you think about Ed setting up, you know, Ali's spot, you know, taking care of your content, you know, Charlie's content. I mean, Charlie had that one post that was didn't it hit one million views or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So you know, there's something to be said for you know, if you, if you touch that one point, you know, all it takes is that one. And phew, so love that. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, I I have one more question really. We talked about this before, and I and I know that you are. But how would you define that you are coachable? You know, you set me up with this one, and I still like don't have a good answer. Ah, I mean, how am I coachable? I think I'm most coachable because of, probably because I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, here. So years ago, this guy was referred to me as a patient. And he's the only person that's ever asked me this question, but I loved it. And he was like, 
on a scale of zero to 10, how good are you? And I was like, that's a really good question to ask mm -hmm. somebody. Cause, and I mean, this guy's a CEO of like a really big company. So it might be a question that like he has locked away for interviews too. And there might be something psychological behind it. I don't know. But again, overthinker. Um, and my answer to him was a seven out of 10. Really? You said seven? Yeah. And, and then he sort of made me talk about it. And I was like, I'm like, look. I'm, I'm very confident I'm above average, but I also feel like I'm so far from being a 10 out of 10. Cause I, one, I don't think 10 out of 10 is achievable. Like I just don't think it's achievable. Um, Cause if you do like, then I don't know, do you retire at 10 out of 10 or do you get a gold medal? Um, but I, I said I was a seven out of 10 because I, I was, I think I'm good to great, but I've got room for improvement and I want, like there always to be room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And even if at some point I feel like I am so good clinically that within that first 90 minutes, I see somebody, I have the perfect plan. Then I'm going to find another component of my professional life, whether it's social media or programming or public speaking to then fill in my seven, seven, my, my gap of seven to 10. It's, it's remarkable. You said that because you know, you can quantify from a, a best in the world, right? You're associating yourself with the best in the world. You're treating the best in the world. So you, you have to be in order to be in that room, right? Like yeah. you've already, you've already qualified. Yeah. The interview already happened. Yeah. Right. Charlie trusts you. Okay. If Charlie trusts you, you're, you're, you're not seven out of 10. Charlie, right? what am I? <laughs> so, but, but, but I think there's, there's lessons here and you, and you said it too. Like if I was a 10 out of 10, you're never technically a 10 out of a 10, right? Technically. Yeah. And that's the, that's the remarkable ability I think with some some people within the fitness industry is they, they think that they can get to 10 out of 10 because they have uh, either influence with follower number or they've made a program work or they've right and then so they they the dichotomy here is this is where I was going earlier is the unique thing about if you're training all day and treating people all day and filling out you know all your notes all day do you have time to do social media most of the time right no. now on the flip side right there's so many people that they don't coach that many people yeah. and so they may have a concept uh, and yeah. or a social media team and they push that social media team slash that concept and it goes <laughs> meanwhile poor kyle poor kevin we're training eight ten hours a day and we don't we don't have a social media team i mean now you do but yeah, yeah. but yeah. The, the concept of, applies of the you know it's sometimes it is the squeaky wheel that that gets the oil yeah and and but going back to the the 10 out of 10 the other thing about all of this is that there's a little bit of ego involved and or not involved. I think with your ability to say that you are a seven out of 10, that means you are aware of who's above you and probably weighing who's above you more. So than necessarily weighing, you know, that you're in the 99th percentile of physical therapists and coaches in the world. So you're technically a 9.9 .9 out of 10, but what made, what, what got you to this point is also having the awareness and the open mind that you always want to get better, that you're reading a book and being like, huh, this is calculus, but it applies to, to training and it applies to physical therapy. And all of a sudden everything does matter when it comes to, like you said, you're going to, you're going to ask a million questions because everything does matter. When it comes down to it, you're going to ask that question until you're like, there it is. And if we replace 10 with infinity, yeah, then it's calculus Oh, there you <laughs> because go. you could become a 9.9. .9. And then maybe, and then you can become a 9.99 and 9.999 and 9.9999, but you'll never get to them. And that's where he lost me. <laughs> Kyle, been a pleasure. Absolutely. This is awesome. Kyle. Yeah. So yeah. fun. He almost went for the hug. Ah, ah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Yeah, dude. I had like a split second moment about 10 minutes ago where I was like, Fuck, I didn't turn the mic on. I really hope Kevin did. But like I saw the I saw the volume.